Last, last week we went through protocols and protocol architectures and we finished on some examples about addresses and today we're going to go through a bit more about addressing and then finish talking about the last topic which is performance in the internet. I think one of the examples we may have had last week was an example of two types of addresses. We mentioned that in the internet that my well, a computer has network interfaces, my laptop has a wireless LAN interface, a Ethernet wired LAN interface, a Bluetooth interface, and interfaces have an address associated with them. We will call a hardware address. In this example, my wireless LAN WLAN zero interface has a hardware address. These twelve hexadecimal digits, zero zero through to nine five and hexadecimal, one hexadecimal digit can be represented by four bits. So these 12 hexadecimal digits is in fact just a 48-bit number. It's a 48-bit address. That's what's called my ha the hardware address, which is assigned to my wireless LAN card when it's manufactured. When I buy the laptop, it comes with it. In addition, my wireless LAN interface, because I've accessed the network, that is the SIT internet, uh, I have an IP address or an internet address shown here, 10.10.99.251. We won't explain the structure, but that turns out to be a 32-bit address. It's 32 bits long. Why do I have two addresses? Why do I have a hardware address and an IP address? That's something we'll try and explain at the start today. Uh, and perhaps more generally, why do we need uh, IP, the internet protocol? So we'll go through an example that tries to illustrate that. And we'll go through on the board. We've mentioned, I think, that all right, computers have a network interface, they have hardware addresses, and we also have IP addresses. Let's consider an example before the internet was around. Let's say there's an organization, some university, and that has its own, so 20, 30 years ago, before the internet became widespread, Individual organizations had their own networks. So within a university, for example, we have our own network. Okay. And what I've drawn here is this cloud, which represents, uh, say, a local area network, a LAN. And there are four computers attached. How are they connected together? I haven't drawn. There may be some device that they all connect to. There may be multiple cables. We don't care. This just rep represents one local area network, let's say for SIT. So the computers on that network can communicate with each other so long as they all support the same protocol, specifically the protocol at the physical and data link layer. Let's try and draw. Let's call this network A, because we'll draw another one shortly. All the computers on that network, if they want to communicate with each other, needs to support the same protocol, specifically the same protocols at the physical layer and the data link layer. If I try and draw the stack, say for this computer here, then at the lowest layer we have the physical layer, and then the data link layer. To communicate across a single network, we've said across a single link, we use the physical layer and data link layer. Across multiple networks, which I'll draw shortly, we use the network layer. Let's just concentrate on the bottom two layers, the physical layer, PHY, and the data link layer, DL. And this is the stack for the computer here, another computer on the same network. 
we'll try and go through this example to explain and lead to the uh, reason why we have IP and why we have different types of addresses. To be able to talk to each other, they must speak the same language. And in this case, they must support the same protocol. And let's call the protocol used at the physical layer protocol A. We're on network A. So this computer, these two computers must support a physical layer using protocol A. And the same at the data link layer. And I'll also call it A. They don't have to be the same here, but in all my examples they will be. And it will be the same for these two computers. If they're on the same LAN, let's say all the computers on SIT's LAN, they all need LAN cards, Ethernet cards. They all need to support talk Ethernet. More generally, at the physical layer, they need to speak, use the same protocol, speak the same language. And at the data link layer, they need to use the same protocol, protocol A, and which means they need to talk the same language to be able to communicate with each other. So here's one network in Thailand. And maybe 20 years ago before, or 20, 30 years ago before the internet was widespread, some other network in the US was built. There are some computers attached. And when the organization that built this network, they chose a different technology. They chose something that's different than protocol A over here. Different organizations, they build their networks independently. There's no need to choose the same technology. You build your network based on your own requirements. And for example, they chose technology B for their network. Maybe technology A is a wired LAN, Ethernet. Technology B is some old network, a token ring network, or some ATM network. So they build their own network. Again, all the computers on that network must support the same protocols to talk to each other. This computer, the same physical layer protocol, B, I'll call it, as this computer. And the same data link layer. independent networks, other side of the world. They work independently. That is, all these computers can communicate, fine. All the computers on computer B can communicate, that's good. But what the internet enables us to do is allow computers on networks B and A to communicate with each other. That's what we'd like. Not just communicate inside our organization, but communicate with anyone else in the world. That's a goal, and that's what the internet allows us to do, to allow this computer using protocol A to talk to some computer over there using protocol B. But we know that two computers cannot communicate if they use different protocols. You must use the same protocol. So how do we solve this problem? How do we allow one over in A to communicate with a computer in network B? If I speak... English, and no Thai, and you speak Thai but no English, how do we communicate? Translator. Translator. We could translate the protocols into the appropriate format. Have a special device on this network, let's say this computer, that translates from protocol A to protocol B. And we'll see it does that in a moment. Now the problem with translation, I speak English only. To talk to you, I would need to translate into Thai, so I'd need some maybe electronic translator that does it for me. Fine. But if I want to talk to anyone in the world, I need to be able to translate into any other language. That adds complexity because to be able to translate, now coming back to protocols, from one protocol, for this computer to be able to translate from one protocol to any other protocol in the world requires some complexity here. And it uh, doesn't scale very well when we've got many different protocols and networks. So that's one approach. What's another approach? I speak English only. You speak Thai but no English. What if we both learnt another language, Spanish? 
if you can speak a different language and I can also speak that, then we can use that other language. And that's effectively what the internet allows us to do, or how the internet works. These computers all speak their own language internally, but to communicate to someone outside, they also speak another language. We'll draw it, and that other language is the internet protocol, IP. I won't draw it here yet. If a computer on network A wants to communicate with a computer on network B, they need to use the same protocol. They don't have to use the same data link layer and physical layer protocol, but to communicate across an internet or across many links, we use the same network layer protocol, which is IP, the most common one. There are others, but in our course we're focusing on the internet protocol. So that's how we achieve communications across the internet, by not forcing, so inside your LAN, use the protocols of your choice. In SIT, we build our network, we choose the technology for the data link layer and physical layer. That's fine. Another company chooses their own technology, whatever their needs. To communicate outside of your LAN, make sure all your computers support the network, the same network protocol, IP, for example and talk IP to computers outside your land. Let's go through that in a bit more depth. Uh, let's connect our networks together. There's another network. Let's call it C. And that's connected to another network called D. And eventually D comes across here and connects into network B. So there we have four networks, or four networks across our, across the world or wherever, connected in this manner in that there's a physical connection, a cable, from this computer to two different networks. So it's a cable into this network and a cable into network C. And similar from this computer, it has cables into network C and into network D. Within their networks, they you all use the same physical layer and data link layer. All these four computers use technology A. In network C, let's say they use technology C. This computer, physical layer with protocol C and data link layer with protocol C. This computer, note, has connections to two different networks. has two cables plugged into it. It has two interface cards, or network interfaces. One supports technology A, the other one must support technology C. The way we draw that in a stack is like this. This is the protocol stack, or architecture, for this computer here. And we'll draw for the others shortly. So this computer, in fact, supports two different protocols. And this one, which connects to network D as well, and finish. I'll draw it here. But These, we'll see, are actually special computers in this network support the technologies that, for the networks that they're attached to. The end computers, what we call the hosts, only have to support their local network technology, B or A in this case. To communicate, let's focus back on network A, to communicate between any of these four computers, we need addresses. It is, this one wants to send to this computer. It needs to know the address of the computer it's sending to. Because remember, the first measure of effectiveness in communications is delivery. I send some data. It must be delivered to the correct destination. How do we achieve that? We use addressing. I set a 
source address and a destination address, when I send something into the network, the destination address tells the network to deliver to the correct computer. So for communications locally, we need addresses. I'll give them addresses. Uh, I'll just give them short addresses. We saw one on the screen, a real address before, but I'll, I will not draw, write down the entire address. Let's call this one A1, A2, A3, and A4. These addresses are associated with the technology used inside the network, specifically the physical and data link layer. They are our hardware addresses. This computer has a network interface and associated with that net network interface is a hardware address or also called a physical address or data link layer address because those addresses are associated with these two layers, a hardware address. We think The black ones here are hardware addresses for the computers. When you buy the computer, it usually comes with a hardware address. And similarly, the computers on here will have hardware addresses. We'll come back to them. And also on network B would have hardware addresses. Because they're using different protocols, they may be of different formats. The hardware addresses I drew over there were uppercase letter A followed by a number. Let's say the hardware addresses here are a different format, just a lowercase letter A, B, C and D a different format or structure of the address the format of the address depends upon the protocol in use it's part of the standard so they may not be the same across all the networks similar in network D and C would have addresses for the devices let's see what have we got this computer here has an address for this interface and it has a second interface to network C so it has another address let's call it uh, we'll use the lowercase structure let's call it A and this computer has a connection to this network C let's call that address B and on network D this computer has an interface to network and let's use the same format as up there D1 and over here, this one supports D2. The values are not important here. The important thing is that the address formats used on each LAN, even inside a wide area network, do not have to be the same across different networks. They may be different. They need to be the same within one network. All need to be the same format for these four computers. But in other networks, they don't have to be the same format as here. They need to be unique as well. That is, we cannot have A, A, A and B. Because then if we send something to computer A, which one does it go to? So we have hardware addresses for all of our network interfaces. When this computer wants to send something to this computer it sets the source address as A4 and the destination address is A1 in the data link layer now to communicate from this computer to a computer on network B this one knows nothing about the data link layer and physical layer technology used in network B it knows nothing about the format of the addresses over there so to communicate across multiple networks, we use IP, or the network layer, and we use IP addresses. So in fact, each computer has, as the slide shows, a hardware address. And if it wants to communicate with other computers on the internet, it also has an IP address. I'll write it in blue. This computer has an IP address. Let's call it IP. 14. This computer, if it wants to communicate with others on other networks, needs an IP address. 
I'm just choosing random numbers here. Don't worry about the values here, just know that they are unique inside our internet. And in network B, those computers also need IP addresses. So to be able to communicate with someone else, you need to use the same protocol and the same address format. Within a LAN, we use the same physical and data link layer protocols as other computers. Across an internet, we use the same network layer protocol, the internet protocol and the IP addresses. Any more addresses? Well, in practice, these intermediate computers also have IP addresses. One for each interface. This computer has interface A2 with an IP address and the interface that connects to network C also has an IP address. Tell me if I get a duplicate. Again, the values don't matter in this case. And interface here with address, hardware address D2 has an IP address. So now in fact we see that all computer interfaces have both a hardware address and an IP address. The hardware address is used for communications inside the network. The IP address is used for communications outside the network, across the internet. And th that allows us any computer computer network in the world, doesn't matter what technology they used internally, that means it doesn't matter what data link layer and physical layer they use, so long as they all support IP, they can communicate with each other. One thing's missing, the stacks. Sorry, I ran out of space. I'm going to move that one, IP117. I've drawn the protocol stack for this computer. It's special in that it connects to two different networks, so it supports two different data link and physical layer technologies, A and C. But it must also support the internet protocol. So the way we would draw that is usually like this, IP. Same with this one, We're running out of space, IP. And So our computers in the network support their own data link and physical layer protocols on their network and all support internet protocol for communications across the internet. They all have a hardware address and an IP address. This is our source computer has an application running on it. So the protocol stack is in fact more. Above that there's the transport layer, and above that the application layer. So what happens when this computer wants to send to someone on network B, who have we got over there, to the computer with IP address 444, then we create some data. The application protocol processes the data, maybe adds a header, so does the transport protocol. Importantly, the IP, or the internet protocol, adds a header, and I'll draw it up here. It specifies a source address and a destination address. If you looked at the Wireshark capture in some depth, you'll see the packets 
have a source IP and a destination IP. What's the value of the source IP address in this packet? What's the value? What is the value of the source IP address in the packet sent by our source computer? IP14. IP14. That is, we're doing, i run out of space here, but this computer, here's the protocol stack. We generate some data, goes through the layers. At the IP layer, we add a header. It contains many things, two things that are important for this example. It contains the source address, the computer who's sending it, and the destination address. The source is IP14, the value. What's the destination? What's the value of the destination address? We're sending to a computer on network B, 444. That's who we want to get this data to. Okay. We want to send, let's say it's a web server over there. We want to send some data from my web browser to a web server on some other computer in the internet. And it, that other computer has an IP address of 444. IP creates an IP packet, sends to the data link layer. Now, what needs to happen to reach that computer on network B, we're going to need to send it, I think you see, through network C and D. We need to send it not direct to computer, the computer in network B. We don't have a link. So we're going to need to send it to here, then to D, and then to B. Specifically, the path that we need to take in this simple example, we would need to send this IP packet to computer A2, which will then send it to this computer, and then the next one, and then on to B, whichever, IP444. So although the IP packet needs to get to the computer over the, on network B, the immediate destination or the, the next computer we send to is in fact this one. And we use the data link layer and the physical layer to deliver this IP packet to this computer here. We create a data link layer packet, running out of space, that also has a source and destination address. What's the value of the source address? This is at, the black one is at the data link layer. A4. This is the, A4 is the hardware address of this computer. At the data link layer we use the hardware address. The source from the perspective of the data link layer is A4. Destination? A2. That is, to reach the computer on network B, we need to send to this computer, which has the address A2. Note that we use the address of the same format. We don't use the lowercase a, that's the address for this other interface. My computer doesn't know about that. It just knows about A2. We create a packet containing the source A4, destination A2, send it, let's say, into the network the network magically delivers it to A2, the destination. A2 receives this packet, processes, and looks at the IP header and realises, okay, in the internet protocol, realises here's a packet from 14 here. It's not going to me, it's not going to this computer, it's going to 444 and then realises, OK, to reach 444, I will need to send this packet again onto this computer. Using data link layer C and physical layer C, it creates a, a new packet with source address A, destination address B, and sends it across this network to this computer. It's, the packet still contains the original IP packet. Remember the way that we do layering? We take the original data, put it inside application layer, transport, IP, 
data link layer, transmit. We still have the IP packet there. We transmit that as is to here. This computer will transmit to here. Then it will transmit eventually to this computer, which will receive and see that the destination address is 444. We see the blue destination is IP444. That is, it's destined to us. So it doesn't send it on to anyone else. It processes it. And I better finish the stack here. IP444. We also have the transport layer and application layer here. This one will receive an IP packet. The destination will be 444. This computer is 444. Therefore, processes the data, sends it up to the next layer, the next layer, until the original data is received and we've finished our communications. We've gone into probably more detail than we need to here because this is moving into how the internet protocol works. We don't cover that until after the midterm. The main point here is that every network interface has a hardware address for communications on its local network inside a LAN or even a wide area network. And every computer that wants to communicate on the internet also has an IP address. We have the both addresses for communications across the internet. The way that we forward the packet across the network we will cover later, we'll cover again. So don't worry too much about that. What do we call this device? We'll see that this is called a router. And we'd normally refer to this source and destination computers as hosts. But again, we'll cover that terminology later. Unfortunately, we're not finished because we need more addresses. My computer, say my laptop, runs multiple applications. It's got a web browser, an email client, and a Skype application running on this computer. I can run many applications on the one computer. And similar, this computer that we're communicating with is running many applications, a web server, an email server, and a Skype application. When my web browser wants to talk to the web server here. It doesn't want to talk to the email server or Skype. When it wants to talk to the web server on this computer, we will send the data to IP address 444. The data will arrive. Then the operating system needs to know which application, web, email, Skype, to deliver that data to. So in fact, we have another type of address that identifies an application on a computer. We think of it as a transport layer address. It's called a port number on the next slide. Because we can have multiple applications on one computer, we can deliver data to a computer now via its IP address, but within the computer, how do we deliver the data to the correct application? Well, we use port numbers, sometimes called generally transport addresses. We can think each application running on your computer has a port number assigned to it. My web browser and normally uh, a normal application will have some random port number. I'm making up some number here. Doesn't matter what the values are. Some number that is the address of the application. We call it a port number. And similar on the server, it also, each application is assigned a port number. Web server, what number? Anyone want to guess? Web server. What port number do you think my web server is running, using? 4813, wrong. Anyone else want to guess? 
two, no, no. Anyone else? You would have heard it. You cannot see it up there, but you may have seen it when you used your web browser, or maybe you've seen it. 80. I think some of you may have seen it. The normal port number used by a web server is port 80. Whereas a client, my web browser, normally gets a random port number. But to communicate with a server, it needs to be a well-known port number. They don't have to be related. The client and the server don't have to have the same port number. They're independent. But typically, a server has a fixed, well-known port number. Email servers are normally 25. Skype, some random number. So servers normally have a fixed port number. Clients, a random port number. So when my web browser sends a packet, the destination port number in that packet, there'll be a field, I've run out of space, but there'll be a source port, 4813, and a destination port, 80. When, and that's part of the transport protocol. When that packet arrives, the transport protocol will see destination 80, send it to the web server. Don't send it to the email or Skype program. So we have hardware addresses, IP addresses, port numbers. There's three different types of addresses. And they are the main ones that our protocols use for communication. The structure of those addresses, the values that are used, how do we get those addresses, we'll cover that uh, most likely after the midterm when we cover the individual protocols. When we cover IP, when we cover TCP, we'll explain again why is it a number like this? Why is an IP address 32 bits and so on? We'll cover that later. For now, just be aware of different addresses. Last type of address, applications may have their own type of address sometimes. Uh, Email addresses. Um, a BitTorrent application may have an address for a, a resource. Instant messaging may have a different type of address. You may write your own application and use your own address format. We refer to them as normally application specific addresses. There are different types. And we have user friendly addresses as well, like domain names, which really is just a user friendly version of an IP address. A domain name corresponds to some IP address. User-friendly, I mean that you and I can remember. The IP address is something that the computer uses to communicate. The computer doesn't use the domain name to send packets. It just uses the IP address. So we identify applications using port numbers and sometimes specific or user-friendly addresses. Any problems with the quizzes this morning? Everyone finished? Quiz 2 and quiz 3? 3 is done? OK. Yes. C, this C. Uh, this is just a computer. And it has interfaces to two different networks. And it, so therefore, it needs a data link layer and physical layer on each of those networks. And because it connects different networks, it must support the internet protocol. What's? Uh, it has two hardware addresses, one for each interface. D2 for this side, lowercase c for this side. When it receives a packet here, the address will be D2. When it sends a packet here, the address will be C. It has two different LAN cards. So when, when it sends a packet from this computer to here, source will be lowercase c, destination will be lowercase a, in the data link layer only. Uh, 
the packet that I captured in Wireshark, and I will not bring it up now because I don't have it anymore, but had all of these addresses in it. That one packet at the transport layer has port numbers. At the IP, the network layer, it has IP addresses. And at the hardware or the data link layer, it has hardware addresses. So that one packet contains all of those addresses. Of course, they may change as the packet sent through the network. Any clarity? Any more questions on that? The main point here is that we have different types of addresses and be aware of how they're used at different layers. On the quiz, I think from now on all quizzes are going to be due 8.30 on Wednesday. It doesn't matter. So I think some people were confused, at least in this, the CS section, that they didn't know what the deadline was. But from now on, all of them will be 8.30 Wednesday morning, the quiz. Before we move on, a slightly different topic. Ah. You can look at some of your addresses by using these software programs on your computer. They work on the command line. There's also graphical user interfaces to show you in Windows, in Mac OS, in Linux. These programs on the command line will show you information about your address, your hardware address, domain names, and some statistics about your network. In Windows, it's not ifconfig, it's ipconfig. In Mac, if it's not ifconfig, I think it's just, what's it called? IP. Uh, I can't, can't remember if Mac supports ifconfig, but it supports the others. We won't do it today. This example we covered before. We're not going to cover. Let's finish on addresses. Clear? Clear as mud? One way to look at those addresses is that, that example last week where I used Wireshark to capture, I posted the file on the website, you can download it, open it in Wireshark, and you'll see it just one packet, and you'll see the addresses there. Uh, maybe before we do go on, as the packet goes across the internet, the source and destination port doesn't change. Okay? The destination port is always 80, that one packet. Similar, the source and destination IP address doesn't change. The source is always this computer, destination always over there. But as we send across this network, we have these source and destination, A4 to A2. But then across this network, it's going to be A to B. And then across this network, D1 to D2. And then at the end, lowercase c to lowercase a. So the hardware addresses change across each network in the packet. Where do we implement our protocols? An approximate classification of where you'll find the, the protocols. Application layer protocols are normally part of applications, the things you can install on your computer. We call them user processes. They're not part of the operating system. You go to the Firefox website, you'll find the source code for Firefox. In that source code, you'll find the C code, or I think it may be C++, for HTTP. Firefox, a web browser, uses the application protocol HTTP. The source code is part of the web browser, or it can be found for the web browser. For the transport and network layer, normally those protocols, TCP, IP, are implemented in your OS. 
you look at the source code for your Linux operating system, you can download it easily, you'll find there TCP C code, C code for IP and so on, so you can see where it's implemented and how it's implemented. It's part of the OS. Data link layer and physical layer are normally part of the hardware, your LAN card, or generally called as a network interface card, a card that interfaces your computer to a network. The, in some cases there are mixes, but that's the, a broad classification of where do you find those different protocols. Hardware, OS, applications. Let's, to finish this topic, just talk a little bit about applications and then perform, performance of those applications. You install a spreadsheet application on your computer. That would be called a standalone application. A standalone application is some application that just works and runs on your computer. You don't need to communicate with anyone on the internet to use that application. That's your typical application which has some user interface graphical interface for a spreadsheet or some command line interface and some what we call application logic. The code that does what the application needs to do. In a spreadsheet, the code that does all the calculations and uh, allows you to move around. That's a normal software application. A networked application or an internet application or a distributed application has those parts but that application works by communicating between different computers, between instances of that application on different computers. The best example you know of is a web browser and a web server. The application works by communicating between a software on one computer and software on another computer, the browser and the server. So networked or internet applications differ from standalone applications in that they have the communication part as well, the software to communicate between them. Another classification of specifically internet or networked applications is into either the traditional or the, the normal internet or data based applications and multimedia or real time applications. We often distinguish between them because they have different requirements in terms of performance. Downloading a file, sending an email, web browsing, remote connection to another computer, all of those applications require some transfer of data between one and, or between two computers where that data normally needs to be 100% accurate. I send an email, the email received must be an identical copy of what was sent. Remember our three measures of effectiveness, delivery, accuracy, timeliness. We always care about delivery. We want to get to the correct destination. With these types of applications, accuracy is very important. Timeliness, not so important. With an email, if it takes one second or if it takes ten minutes, it's still okay. But if I send an email and there's errors in what's received, that's not okay. Accuracy is important. Real-time or multimedia applications. YouTube is considered partly in that part, in that we're streaming video from a server to a client. Or streaming audio. Skype, you're making a voice call or even a video call across a network. Gaming where you're sending information about a user's location to a server and getting real-time updates of where other players are in the gaming system. Sharing your desktop with other users, collaborative applications. These type of applications, timeliness is more important, at least as is important as accuracy. When you are talking to someone via Skype, or some other voice over the internet application, the delay between when you talk and when they receive it can
cannot be too large. If it's larger than several seconds, you will not be able to have a conversation. Normally we expect in terms of the tens of milliseconds, possibly hundreds of milliseconds for voice conversations. Similar with uh, audio and video streaming, especially live streaming. If it's live content, the delay from when it's generated and when it's received by you should be small. The timeliness is more important with these applications than with the traditional applications. The last thing that we want to focus on in this topic is how do we measure the performance of our applications and our network? And we'll go through, I think we'll have time just for the first three mainly today. What performance metrics do we have? Before I remove all of this, any last questions on those addresses? If we have a quiz in the class, you can answer questions about which address to use at which layer. So you should be able to associate the addresses, like an IP address, with a network layer, for example. Let's remove it and look at performance. When, when you go get a job, your IT, you'll be an IT professional. One thing you may have to do in your job is to build a network. Maybe you're employed to set up a network for a company or to create an application that works across a network, an internet application. And therefore, one thing you'll need to know about is uh, when you choose a technology, or you, that is, you choose the technology for the network, you need to choose the best one. And the best one normally is the cheapest one that performs sufficiently. And some of the performance criteria that we, you would need to choose based upon, we're going to go through. Same if you write an application that works across a network. Some of these criteria that we go through, are, you need to consider when you write that application. The first one, bandwidth, is related to the physical layer. When I transmit, so here's my LAN cable. It's actually some copper wires in there. When I plug them into my two laptops, which I will do shortly, what happens is that the transmitter in one laptop generates an electrical signal and it propagates across the copper wire and is received at the other end point. So that signal ha covers a range of frequencies in, in, uh, in the spectrum. And the range of frequencies that are transmitted in that signal is called the bandwidth. So we think this is our link or generally a channel. So the range of frequencies that we can transmit through some communications channel is called the bandwidth. We will not explain it too much now because the next topic goes into and explains more detail, but we'll give an example. The typical bandwidth that your LAN card transmits signals at using such a cable. Uh, this cable has some writing on, the, on it and it says somewhere it's a category 5, a category 5E cable. You can look up on the internet or somewhere and you'll see the, the characteristics of such a cable and the bandwidth supported as an example, is 100 megahertz. What that means is when we send signals through that cable, those signals have different frequencies. 
ranging from 0 or 1 hertz up to 100 megahertz. So the, the width, the range of frequencies was 100 megahertz. That's an important char characteristic of communications links. Another thing, the one thing that you will be more familiar with is, okay, that's about a signal being sent, but often with digital communications we care about sending bits. The data rate specifies the rate at which bits can be sent across a link or a channel. How many bits per second? Data rate. As an example, when I plug this cable into my two laptops, the LAN card, not the wireless LAN, but the wired LAN card in each laptop supports transmitting at some data rate. What do you think it is? Wired LAN, what do you think the data rate is supported by my wired LAN in, inside my laptop? Someone have a guess. What do you think? The data rate supported by wired LAN, Ethernet. 100 100 megabits per second is a good, good answer. Hundred megabits per second is a, is the most common data rate supported by your LAN card. In fact, in the past there was a slower speed, ten megabits per second. And in fact, most computers you buy today, this newer laptop supports one gigabit per second. 1,000 megabits per second. That is the rate at which I can send data across the link, the number of bits per second that can be transmitted across the link. These are three different values. Most LAN cards will support the current, well, will support the slower rates. I think this laptop supports all three. My older laptop, the blue one, supports just 110 megabits per second. I'm going to connect the two computers and then look at some of those details. And start this one. So now I have the simplest of networks that you can create. Two computers connected directly together. They cannot communicate with anyone else. I've turned off the Wi-Fi. Just two computers. When I connected to the wireless LAN with my blue laptop, I had an IP address, 10.10.99.251. I've turned off the wireless LAN. I still have a hardware address that's associated with the hardware, but no longer an IP address because the, it's uh, been disabled. That's my wireless LAN interface, but I've now plugged a cable into my Ethernet interface, my wired LAN, ETH0. I have a different hardware address, no IP address yet. In my network, of just two computers, I have to manually create or assign an IP address. I'll do that first. There's different ways to do it. I will use ifconfig to give an IP address to my computer. I can choose anyone that I like. So long as it's the same or no, I will not explain the structure of IP addresses. At this stage, I'll choose an IP address as long as it's different from my other computer, my laptop, my second laptop. I think this one's 20, I'll make this one's 30, maybe 40, I can't remember. Let's not worry about the IP address structure yet, that part. And turn it on.
So I've now for my Ethernet, my wired LAN interface, I have an IP address, 192.168.1.40. Let's draw my network. This is 192.168.1.40. And my other laptop, the bigger one, is 192.168.1.20. And I've connected a cable directly between the two. The bandwidth of that cable, EW, I know from past experience is 100 megahertz. What's the data rate? Well, the data rate depends upon the characteristics of the cable and the transmitter and receiver, that is the LAN cards inside those computers. To check the data rate, I can use a command. And the command on my computer is called ETH tool, a tool to looking at my Ethernet interface. shows a lot of information, something that we know, it shows a speed, 100 megabits per second. So the data rate for this link is 100 megabits per second. It turns out that my blue laptop supports links using 10 megabits per second and 100 megabits per second. My other laptop supports 10, 100, and 1,000. They choose the highest that are supported by both, 100 in this case. So the link is set at a rate of 100 meg megabits per second. I can send one mil 100 million bits every second across my link. The other information not so useful for us at this stage. And the link is detected, that's good, it's yes. So, what I'm going to do now is transfer a file across this link. And we're going to measure how long it takes. I've configured this laptop to run as a web server. That is, it's running web server software. And I've put a file on there. The name is meg100. It's just a binary file. And importantly, it's about 100 megabytes in size. So there's a file on this laptop, which is 100 megabytes in size. And I'm going to use a program to download it using HTTP. So transfer the file from here to here, 100 megabytes. How long, <coughs> how long is it going to take? How long is it going to take? Bonus, a free quiz if you give them the correct answer. That is, you can miss a quiz and I will not count it for the first person to give me the correct answer. Or if you've already missed one, then that won't matter. How long is it going to take to download this file? This 100 megabyte file. I see some people writing down. Good. We've got a 100 megabyte file. That's the size. How fast can we send it? 100 megabits per second is the speed. So, how many? Four. One. No. Someone else said 0 0.8. Some. No. Eight hours. Wrong. Eight seconds. Anyone else? I don't know. We're going to try in a moment and then see. Anyone else want to have a guess? Someone said 0.8. Sorry, I shouldn't have said no, but we'll try. So 1.8 and 8. Let's download. Why did you come up with 8? I think you'll be the closest. 
How did you come up with eight? Eight seconds. Change the units of the file size from 100 megabytes to megabits. Multiply by eight, that is. We get 800 million bits, lowercase b, and then divide by the data rate. We have 800 million bits. We can send 100 million bits every second. Therefore, the time should be 8 seconds. We, we have a size in bits. We have a rate in bits per second. Size divided by rate gives us time. Same as you want to drive 200 kilometers. You can drive at 100 kilometers per hour. You can calculate the number of hours, two hours to take. How did you calculate one second? Uh, the conversion between bytes and bits, but that's okay. What I'm going to do is use a software program to download the file and it will time how long it takes. Instead of using my browser, because my browser doesn't report how long it takes, or at least not very accurately, I'm just going to use a simple program on the command line to download. I'll give the address. The program's called wget. The address of the server is 192.168.1.20. And the file that I want to get, I know is in the ITS323 directory, and it's called meg100.bin. And when I, so what's going to happen when I press enter, this is like a simple, simple web browser. Sends a request to the server for the file, the server sends back the file. And this program saves the file on my disk. But what we need is it reports some statistics. It's downloading. It took 8.5 seconds. Close, but wrong. The closest of the three. Sorry. Why was it wrong? Here, all right, this calculation made sense. We have a file of 100 megabytes or 800 megabits. We have a data rate of 100 megabits per second. Therefore, it should take eight seconds to transfer that. But the real transfer took 8.5 seconds. Only a small difference, but in fact quite big compared to uh, that only because what? Because of the bandwidth? No, the bandwidth in fact is related to the data rate. One thing, and it's a very small thing, not so important, but one thing is that the file is not exactly 100 megabytes. But that's, that's not the reason, really, or that's not the main reason. The reason is, the reason it was a bit slower than what we expected is because there are, in fact, overheads. It's not just the file that we need to download. There are all the headers. I will not draw it in detail, but if you remember back to last week, we went through with HTTP, we start with some data, we add some header, with HTTP, then we in the next layer we add some more header and some more and some more and it, what it turns out the data, the original data, the file, is this part, but we've got these extra headers which also contribute or also need to be sent across the link. They take some time. That is, there's some overhead in using the protocol. The overheads are contributed by headers, sending extra information, not just the data. Sometimes protocols, we send some data. Before we send any more, we have to wait for an acknowledgement. So they may be sometimes spent not sending. In general, 
compared to the rate, data rate of our link, a protocol introduces overheads, which leads to a lower performance than the, ab than the capacity or the data rate. We call the performance of the data transfer throughput. It's another performance metric. It's how fast do we transfer the real data, not just the uh, transfer bits across the link, but the rate at which the real data is transferred across the network or link. I'll come back and explain or show a calculation shortly. In this program, it's reported here. The throughput was 11.2 megabytes per second. 11.2 times by 8 is, what is it, 89.6 megabits per second. 11.2 megabytes per second was the rate at which the file was transferred, which is our throughput, the rate at which the data that we're interested in was delivered. 11.2 multiplied by 8 is 89.6 megabits per second. The data rate, the maximum rate at which bits are sent across the link is 100 megabits per second. But because of overheads, we're slightly less, about 90% of the total, 89.6 megabits per second. As a result, the time is slightly higher, 8.5 seconds as opposed to exactly 8 seconds. So we have two measures here about the performance in terms of bits per second. We have a performance of the signals being sent, usually measured in bandwidth. In terms of the data, the bits being sent, the link has some data rate. That's what we call the capacity of the link. It depends upon the, the link characteristics. It depends upon the transmitter and receiver device. Usually that's fixed. You buy a tablet, it has Wi-Fi built in. Wi-Fi has a maximum data rate, which is, what's the maximum data rate you can send across Wi-Fi? And in wi wireless LAN, it's in fact different from this. Wi-Fi, either 54 megabits per second, uh, some newer ones are even up to 300 megabits per second. But the, the hardware usually has some limits. That's what we call the data rate or capacity. But now when you use that link, your <coughs> software, your web browser, the operating system introduces some overheads, some extra things that you need to send. And the protocols, the way they behave, introduce overheads. So the rate at which the real data is sent is referred or is delivered to the destination is referred to as throughput which is less than data rate we want throughput as high as possible but we cannot avoid some overhead sometimes five minutes remaining I want to go through an example if I can find it that quickly calculates throughput this is from a quiz two years ago. It's a very simplified protocol architecture just to make the calculations faster. Let's make some space. We have a protocol architecture, not five layers, but two layers. Let's call well, at top and bottom. That's what the question calls them. And the protocols used at each layer have some, they take some data and they apply some operations and importantly they add some header. So in this question, where's my pen? We start with 10,000 bytes of real data. The user generates 10,000 bytes of data. We start with 10,000 bytes, I'll draw that here. And then the top layer protocol, what does it do? Adds a 20-byte header. So we start with 10,000 bytes, 
the protocol goes to work, one thing it does is adds a header. So we'll draw that as we have the original. When we send the data to the top layer protocol, it takes the original 10,000 bytes of real data and adds an 80 byte header. 20 byte header, sorry. It's not to scale. And then it sends all of that, that 10,020 bytes, to the next layer, the bottom layer in our case. The bottom layer has something a little bit different that we haven't seen. Rather than sending all of it across the link at one time, this bottom layer, the protocol there, breaks it into chunks or segments. And the rule is that in this simple example, each segment will be no larger than, will contain no more than 3,000 bytes of data. So how we interpret that, we have 10,020 bytes coming to this bottom layer protocol. It breaks it into segments. 3,000, 3,000, 3,000, and the last segment will be 1,020 bytes. We have 10,020 segments no larger than 3,000, so we get three at that size, and then one at the remaining 1,020. This is a, the part of the protocol. Then, for each segment, the, is transmitted across the link with a 10-byte header. So we take the first segment, the 3,000 bytes, and add a 10-byte header to that. Same with the second segment. Third and the last. So in fact, what the bottom layer does is takes the data received from the higher layers, breaks it into segments, adds a header to each segment, 10 bytes in length, and then transmits the segments one after another as some signal across the link. So it transmits out of the computer. So what you can think of is what's coming out of this computer here, what comes in is the first, or is the original 10,000 bytes of data. What comes out after the protocols do their processing is these four segments. How many bytes come out? How many bytes come out? Simply add up these numbers. Total that comes out is 10,060 bytes. Just the sum of these parts. Or the original 10,000 of data plus the 20 byte header plus four 10 byte headers. 10,060 bytes. Let's say our data rate, the question doesn't give it, but let's say the data rate of our link is one megabit per second. The user creates 10,000 bytes of data. The protocols add headers such that the total amount transmitted is 10,060 bytes. That is an overhead of 60 bytes. We can transmit those 10,060 bytes at a rate of one megabit per second. How long does it take to transmit all 10,060 bytes? The bytes to transmit in total 10,060 the rate at which we're transmitting is one million bits per second. I'll make that a bit clearer. Which is the same as one bit per microsecond. One million bits per second is the same as transmit one bit in one microsecond. This was 10,060 bytes, which is the same as 80,480 bits, just multiplied by 8. 
80,480 bits transmitted at 1 million bits per second, the time it takes is just the division. Divided by 1 million bits per second, or 1 bit per microsecond, The reason I use one bit per microsecond, you don't have to. The only reason I did it is because it makes the division easy. Divide by one. It's obvious. Which is the same as 80.48 milliseconds, which is the same as 0 0.08048 seconds. Take 10,000 bytes of data, transmit 10,060 bytes across our link at some speed. The time it takes to transmit is 80.48 milliseconds. Bytes times 8 is bits divided by 1 million bits per second. I divided by 1 bit per microsecond. What's our throughput? That's what we want to finish with. The throughput is the rate at which we deliver the real data. How am I going to calculate throughput? The rate, so it's going to be bits per second, that we deliver real data. The amount of real data, user data, is the original 10,000 bytes. I've got 10,000 bytes. How long does it take? Any of these three numbers. 80,480 microseconds. Solve that and you get approximately 994,000 bits per second. Or 0. 9.94 megabits per second. All right, I've gone through the maths quickly. You can check that. The point is that we take the real data. We add some header. We transmit the real data plus the header. That takes time. The throughput is the measure of how fast do we deliver the real data. Not the header. We don't care about that as the user. We care about the 10,000 bytes of real data divided by the total time it takes to deliver that. Gives us 0.994 megabits per second, where our data rate was 1 megabit per second, i.e. our throughput is slightly less than our data rate in this case. to make sure that you can do that calculation. In the question, when you go home today, the maximum size of the packet was 3,000 bytes. Same question, but change that to 300. See what you come up with. That is exactly the same, but instead of breaking into 3,000 bytes, break into 300 bytes. We're out of time. We'll finish there. Tomorrow you'll give me the answer to that, the 300 byte case, and we'll continue with the other performance metrics.